Okay. So today we are going to talk about a foundational halacha and attitude that is embedded in Jewish life, and it cannot be extricated from Jewish life. In other faith um, communities or faith beliefs, there are um, monastic traditions, we can call them. Traditions where people go and they take a vow of celibacy and they spend their lives in that vow, both men and women throughout various faiths, not just Christianity. In um, some Eastern religions as well, they have vows of celibacy, monks and nuns and so on, but they also have people who go and live alone. We can call it an English hermit, a hermit tradition. And they go and they live alone and they, um, like a Walden Pond, they sit and they reflect on nature and the nature of being. And this is the view that they take that is necessary to come closer to Hashem. Judaism says something very different. What is a holy lifestyle and a holy place in which to live that lifestyle? The most shocking information is, is that it is living in not just a community, but even within a city. Okay. Now, if you're a nature lover, don't worry. You don't have to live in a city. But Jews have to live with community. Now, Hashem hit the joy and delight and love he receives and gives comes from people, human beings. Those are the gems of his creation. And so, even though in Judaism, we have Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, which undoubtedly is a holy place, and we have other holy places, the pinnacle of holy places in Judaism, the holy city is Jerusalem. Okay? So Jerusalem is not a big city, but it is a crowded city. And we are told that it was always a crowded city, especially at the time of the festivals, the three holy festivals, uh, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. The Jews would come to the uh, holy temple to make their offerings. And it was packed. And the Torah tells us that it's quite amazing that nobody went out without food to eat or a space to stay, even though it was jam packed. And we see this today in the more, let's call them observant communities. Okay, the more on the scale of observant, we find that people often live uh, piled on top of each other. Now, I'm not saying this is comfortable and I'm not saying this is necessary. I'm just saying that this is a fact. And we are told that the Jewish community has a special protection that it offers to those Jews who live there because everybody is busy doing mitzvot. They're doing the commandments. They are fulfilling them. And the mitzvot, comes from the word or is related to the word sevet, also the word savta, which means a bond or connection. And therefore, a mitzvah is, in the singular, a connection and bond to God. And mitzvot, in the plural, are many connections and bonds with God. Okay? So when we fulfill the mitzvot, we are fulfilling not only just commandments from Hashem that we are told we have to do, but we are fulfilling a, um, a spiritual action that is connecting us deeper to God. Now, we are also told that there are many benefits and requirements to living in the Jewish community that are very practical. So for example, you have to go you have to hear the Torah read. You can't do that if you live out in the country without a shul, without at least a minion of 
forum in that shul, in that synagogue, okay? In the Jewish community, you can buy kosher food. If you live in the middle of nowhere, it's much more difficult to get kosher food, okay? In a Jewish community, there are many practical benefits that people who move to them for the first time are often delighted and surprised about. For example, if you open up a phone book, which we still print in a Jewish community, such as where I live in Brooklyn, Borough Park and, and the Williamsburg community too, you will, and also the Flatbush community, these are all religious communities, you will see many, many pages filled with gamachs. What is a gamach? A gamach is a free loan society. If you need money for something, whether it's to pay a bill or start a business, a gamach will lend you that money without interest and the pressure to pay back, even though you sign a contract, you'll pay it back in a certain amount of time. The pressure isn't very much. People understand that things are hard for people and they're usually um, very supportive. But there's more than that. Why so many of them? Because people take that word to mean many things. So there's a gamach for, for example, chairs. Let's say you're having a, a simcha, a celebration in your home, or you're inviting a rabbi to speak and you only have eight chairs, but you know 30 people will come. There's a chair gamach that will deliver those chairs to you. Okay. And then many of them will even pick them up when you're done. And they've done this for free or for a nominal fee just to keep um, but to keep things repaired in good repair. There's a wedding gown gamach. There's a baby stroller gamach. There's a band gamach if you need a band to play for a wedding. And now you're really getting a free, a free gift, but this is for people who really need it. And so on and so forth. Um, there are gamachs that are loans and gamachs that are just outright gifts, but fall under the category of gamach anyway. There's some amazing benefits to living in a religious community. There are more benefits. Shabbat. You never have to eat a Shabbat meal alone. Many people moving into a Jewish community are single. They're new converts. They're new, new balei tshuva. And they want to become part of Jewish life. And the most easy way to do that is to jump into Shabbat because, why? Because it takes up a whole day. And it's a day where we're focused on connection with other people, love, prayer, spirituality, and I'll add good food. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. As Rebbe Nachman says, eating on Shabbat is as holy and maybe even more holy and accomplishes even more than fasting during the week. It's very good for the soul. Okay. So there are other benefits. Okay. Move in with a family. You have yeshivas and base yakos to send your children to. You move in as a single, everybody's going to want to try to find you a match. Everybody's going to be a matchmaker for you. So there are a lot of benefits. There are practical drawbacks. If, like me, you're a nature person and you like a lot of quiet and you like gardening, you might not find a community that's suburban or rural. You might end up moving into at least a small city type community. Okay. It might be difficult depending where you work. Um, it might also be difficult because there's a bit of a culture shock. If you live in a community like I do, people didn't grow up with movies the way I did. People don't certainly don't have television. Most people don't have internet, at least not in their homes. And you know, if that's what you're used to, it will be a culture shock. And there's benefits to that as well. You'll see the beautiful, holy, innocent children being so excited if they see a fireman or a policeman or a construction site, they'll just be in awe and they'll crowd around and ask questions in awe because they'll be so excited to see the kind of heroes that America had in the 1950s. Okay, I'm reminded of that because it's Lagba Omer today. And last night, there are many bonfires throughout Borough Park and a lot of firemen and a lot of police, of course, monitoring things. And all the children are just so excited to see them. So there, you know, it depends what kind of community that you live in, but it is a requirement. It's, it's a requirement, though, not only for your own apparent good. And this is really what I want to get to. 
It's a requirement because moving to a Jewish community, living in a Jewish community, there are mitzvot that you cannot do living on your own or living in a very tiny community. It's much harder. Living in a halachic community, a community that's Torah observant, you have the opportunity to grow spiritually exponentially that you don't have not living in a community. And I would like to begin a little bit describing um, some of the mitzvahs that you can do, the mitzvot that you can do living in a community. The very simple ones, like you can give charity, you could help your neighbor and so on. But where do we find these kinds of interpersonal mitzvot? We find them in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, which is the book of Vayikra, in the Torah portion called Kadoshim. What does Kadoshim mean? It means holies or holinesses or something to do with the holiness of things. Okay. And this is the name of the Parsha. And it's taken from the, the second verse where Hashem is speaking to Moshe and he's telling him, speak to the entire congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And then it gives a list of how one can be holy, how we can fill the commandment to be holy. It doesn't say go meditate in a mountain or go live by yourself somewhere away from community. What it gives is a list primarily, not only, of mitzvot that involve interpersonal relationships. So, for example, it says, um, you shall not lie one man to his fellow. I'm not allowed to tell a lie. I'm not even allowed to, to fudge a little bit, okay? We're not. Um, you shall not steal, okay? Um, you shall not oppress your fellow. You shall not rob. If you have a hired worker, okay, you have to pay that worker that day. You can't hold his wage. I'm not talking if you have a business and you pay somebody every two weeks. That's a different agreement. But if you have somebody who comes to your house to fix the plumbing, you have to pay him right away. These are expected to be fulfilled in a Jewish community. There are many more. Um, you shall not place a stumbling block before a blind person. What does that mean? So the Torah is a, is a brief, okay? It's an outline. Here we're getting an outline of the laws. And then our sages explain to us what all the laws mean. That means, for example, you shouldn't lead someone astray, lead someone away from spirituality, lead someone away from Hashem, okay? Um, you shall commit no injustice in judgment. So if you are on a, a judge in a court, excuse me, you're a judge in a court, you can't favor a poor person just because they're poor. Neither can you favor a rich person just because he's rich and powerful, okay? Um, you shall not go around as a gossip monger among your people, gossip is strictly forbidden. And what, what means gossip? What is gossip? We have many, many texts that explain the details about what is acceptable speech and what isn't. We're required to guard our speech. Um, you shall, um, I'm skipping some, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. What does that mean? It means you shan't hold a grudge. Okay, our sages tell us. But by the way, I'm just giving you an overview because I want to give you examples. Okay, what means with a grudge means if your neighbor, okay, our sages tell us if your neighbor um, wouldn't lend you, let's say his hammer in the morning, but then in the evening he knocks on your door and wants a cup of sugar. You can't withhold your cup of sugar just because he wouldn't lend you the hammer. You have to give him the cup of sugar he wants. Okay. Um, you shall not take revenge on someone, okay? And the 
most significant and often quoted line in Torah, perhaps the most quoted, because we say it every morning before we say our morning prayers, kamocha. you shall love a member of your people the way you love yourself. Okay? That's what you have to do. Do good unto others. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Or if you don't want to be treated exactly in the way that they want to be treated, then you have to treat them in the way that's correct for them. So we have a lot of interpersonal laws in Judaism. And if you go to a Jewish bookstore, you will see dozens, if not hundreds of books already translated into English and many, many more in Hebrew about this topic. Now, these laws are as essential to being a Jew and living a Jewish life as the laws of keeping Shabbat and not mixing meat and dairy together. We are told by our sages that we don't know which laws are more important than others, which mitzvot, which commandments are more important than others, and that we have to treat them all equally. However, however, there is a special love that Hashem has for a Jew who helps other Jews and who loves other Jews. So the benefits of living in a Jewish community mean that you can fulfill these laws that are very difficult to fulfill on Zoom or, or on the phone. Okay, now, um, the, the gist of this is, and why I'm bringing these laws up today is for a very significant reason. And that is that moving to any new community or new culture is very difficult. Adjusting is difficult. It has challenges. I myself have lived in Borough Park for 20 years. And when somebody says, I've lived in Borough Park, you're a resident. How do you like it? I say, I don't know yet. I'm still a tourist. Okay. I'm still a tourist. I have friends here. I love the people here, but I didn't grow up here. And I'm learning new things all the time. There's cultural differences. They, they're not Torah differences per se. They're cultural differences. They're expressions of Torah through culture. And one of the things that I would like to share with you about the challenges and difficulties of moving into a community and living in community is that just like anything else, there are imperfect people. There are challenges. There are miscommunications. There are some people who, for whatever reason, are working on other areas of themselves spiritually and not necessarily working on the interpersonal stuff that we would like everyone to work on. And this can cause um, pain. It can cause pain to a newcomer. And it can cause a newcomer to feel like, am I ever going to fit in? Am I ever going to be part of the Jewish community? Now, what I want to say is there are many different types of Jewish communities, so you have to find the one that's right for you. But another thing I want to say, especially to those of you who are living in a Jewish community, is that our test and our challenge is, despite noticing the imperfections, is to look for the good. Okay? To look for the good. Because people are people. People make mistakes. People make a lot of mistakes in interpersonal relationships. For me, my biggest bugaboo here is the bad driving. It really gets to me. Okay. I try to not look at the bad driving, the bad drivers. Okay. It's, it's whatever it is. Everybody's rushing to get places. Okay. You might have other things. And the idea is, is that we are commanded via hafta l'reacha kamocha. Okay to love our fellow. And the final words of that verse, which is uh, in, in the Parsha, in Leviticus, it's 19, 18, 19, verse 18, is Ani Hashem, I am your Lord. Hashem puts, I am your Lord, right after 
that commandment to love each other. And this is telling us is a very important thing that we have to pay attention to. And that Hashem himself loves us, fulfills this mitzvah. Hashem fulfills all the mitzvahs, our sages tell us, the mitzvot, our sages tell us. And he's looking at the good, not only in those other people over there, but in you. Rabbi Nachman teaches us how to fulfill this mitzvah. This mitzvah of living with other people who are imperfect and who are flawed, just like we are. And they do things that upset us, they get on our nerves, they don't fulfill all our needs, they're not going to meet all our needs, and we're frustrated, and we yet at the same time, we have to love each and every member of our people. So Rebbe Nachman has a lesson. It's Lakute Moron 282. It's a lesson called Azamra. It is a foundational teaching in Breslov, so foundational that we are encouraged to learn it all the time, to relearn it and relearn it. I relearn it several times a year. Okay, I always get something new from this lesson. You can Google it. You can find it online. A-Z-A-M-R-A. That's the name of it, Azamra. And this lesson begins with a, um, a very strongly worded piece of advice to, uh, to be dan lechath schus, another person. That means to, we translate it as give them the benefit of the doubt, but it also means to judge them on the side of merit. To look at another person and to say, okay, they're flawed. Let me look for the good in them. Let me forget about that and look for the good in them. It's not judging a negative act positively. What it's doing is judging the person positively. Okay. Maybe they try to help you and they're heavy handed and they're making a, making an error and, and they're misjudging you or whatever. Doesn't give us an excuse to misjudge them. They may never have learned as Amra and you're learning it today right now. We are told by the Rebbe to look for the Nikuda Tova, the good point in our people, in each person we encounter. And I would also say that the more you can look for the good in all of the people of the world, the more positive you feel about the world as a whole. And of course, I'm not talking about people who are like seriously problematical or violent. I'm not talking about that. People who are hurting people. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in general. The next part of that lesson is to look for the good point inside yourself. To really understand that there is a link between how you look at the outside world and how you look at the world inside you. Okay. When we notice a lot of flaws and imperfections, the Rebbe's telling us, and the Baal Shem Tov, his great grandfather, also told us this is what we call today projection. We are projecting the negativity inside ourselves outwards. Because if we only saw ourselves as good and holy beings connected to Hashem, we would see other people that way. And we would we kind of not notice the negative so much. Maybe it'll just momentarily notice it, but we won't focus on it. This is a core teaching and an approach to fulfilling this mitzvah the mitzvah, the commandment, okay, to love your fellow.